Funding for this program was provided by the Annenberg CPB Project. Sometimes, as we go through life, we master our experiences. Sometimes we don't. I've been trying to keep cool. Uh, there are just so many things happening right now. Um, you say keeping cool? Yeah. Cool with her? How do you do that? Well, I mean, there, there are just so many things happening in my life right yeah, now. I know, there are. As we've seen in previous programs, there are a variety of treatments available for people with psychological disorders. In this program, we take a look specifically at psychotherapy as a treatment for people who may be having some trouble dealing with personal or professional relationships, but who are functioning well in other aspects of their life. We'll look at three kinds of individual psychotherapy, as well as therapy in other settings like couples and groups. In order to do this, we asked actors skilled in role-playing to study some case histories and then improvise as patients with professional psychotherapists for several sessions. The therapists knew the patients were actors, but knew nothing about their cases. Each therapist later said that the actors were extremely convincing in their role playing. Research has shown that psychotherapy can be effective for certain kinds of problems and certain kinds of individuals. But how? Some experts have suggested that an essential component of the change process that goes on in therapy involves the matching of patient or client to therapist and the special relationship that develops. Dr. Marvin Goldfried, who will comment throughout this program, talks about the value of this therapeutic relationship. The, the, the therapy relationship is really uh, quite unique and very different from any other kind of relationship that somebody would have with another person. Um, in the sense that when one sees a therapist, the therapist provides the patient with his or her own un undivided attention. There's a total commitment to the welfare of the patient. There's a concern for the patient. There's a caring for the person. Uh, and hopefully this will be communicated. And the communication of another person who cares, who's concerned, who's attentive, who's interested, in itself can be quite supportive, quite therapeutic and can help to some extent to uh, to take the edge off whatever despair or demoralization or pessimism a person may have when they first enter therapy. The first therapy we look at can be considered to be the oldest form of talking therapies. In this segment, an actor plays Tom, a man in his 30s who is complaining of problems in dealing with his supervisor at work and who is upset because he thinks his girlfriend, Patty, is going to leave him. To an outsider, the information gathering that goes on in a first session like this is not very exciting. For the therapist, however, it's a chance to look for nuances and clues to what may be at the heart of the client's feelings of anxiety, depression, or as we'll see with Tom, actual physical discomfort. Tom, could you tell me what, uh, what brought you to see me today? Well, <clears throat> I work as an assistant office manager at, uh, at a, a large architectural firm and um, <clears throat> have been having some difficulties with uh, the guy who's directly above me his name is is Dave um, and um, when the general managership was open I applied for it and Dave came in from outside the company uh, and got it and I 
guess I felt like I should have it. Um, I've been having a lot of difficulty in dealing with him since he's been there. Um, I, it's even been manifesting itself physically. Uh, I've, I'm getting a lot of tension in the back of my neck. I get headaches uh, at work when I know that I have a meeting with him. Uh, I'll begin to, to sweat. Uh, I get very uncomfortable. I get nervous. Yeah. Um, and but mostly it's it's been getting really bad with. As Dr. Cooper listens to Tom talking about these physical and, symptoms, uh, he may begin to get clues about deeper, uh, hidden problems or conflicts. In so fact, discovering can, such buried conflicts is at the heart of psychodynamic therapy, which was developed by Sigmund Freud. Freud believed that unresolved issues or conflicts from crucial childhood years shape adult behavior. The purpose of therapy is to resolve these conflicts, which have been forced out of awareness in order to guard against the anxiety that would surface if the conflicts were felt consciously. The fundamental principle of uh, psychodynamic therapy is that uh, there are thoughts and feelings which exist outside of awareness and are called uh, unconscious or um, simply not within awareness, and they exert a very powerful influence. And uh, through creating uh, conflicts and through guiding someone's behavior, uh, the uh, goal is to try and understand what these um, unconscious attitudes and feelings are. By asking a very simple and general question, Dr. Cooper encourages Tom to feel free to say anything that comes to mind on the assumption that his conflicts will rise to the surface. Here, Tom divulges a very critical piece of his past. Could you tell me a little bit about uh, what the rest of your life is? Well, um, I live in the suburbs with... Uh, a woman, uh, Patty, uh, and her daughter, Cindy. Um, and well, there's there's one thing that's that's uh, come up lately for me uh, that has to do with my family. My older brother committed suicide when I was ten, and. Um, it's something that been, that's been on my mind lately. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to deal with it. I've been doing a lot of reading. Uh, I've been thinking about it. Um, I I don't feel like I've I've really dealt with a lot of the the feelings that have gone along yeah. with with that incident. It's a big part of my life that I I just haven't allowed myself to understand. Mm -hmm. When did you find out that he died and when did you find out that it was really through suicide? Uh, we found out the next day. Uh, I heard my parents talking, uh, I heard my mother crying, um, and my father came in and spoke with me and told me that, that my brother had died. died. And, um, said that uh, he didn't want me to get all emotional about it because it just wouldn't help uh -huh. the situation with my mother. And um, that He wanted I, you to sort of protect your mother? He wanted me to, to be strong uh -huh. and, um, and be there for, for my family. Uh, because he said that he, he 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 couldn't handle it if everybody was going to wind up in hysterics about it. Mm, it's a lot to ask of a ten-year-old. Yeah. What uh, Cooper was trying to do was to, to make it very clear to the patient that his sense of control uh, in in and lack of self-expressiveness had its roots early on when his brother committed suicide and. 
his father told him that he had to be strong. Uh, and in, in acknowledging that that was a lot to ask, he's kind of implying that um, that he, first of all, that he shouldn't blame himself for doing that, uh, and that it was an unusual set of circumstances in his past, certainly it was, uh, and also he then tied it in to what was going on in his current life and the difficulty he had in expressing himself. As therapy progresses, and as Tom is on the way to recognizing some of the deeper problems behind his current complaints, Dr. Cooper is able to help Tom discover these connections and to understand the meaning of his emotions and behavior. Not only about this single event, but about what it may reveal about a general pattern of experience in childhood. These interpretations are a key tool in psychodynamic psychotherapy. Here, Dr. Cooper makes an interpretation that helps Tom gain insight into how his past is influencing his present, as well as how he feels about these influences. Who did you, who did you depend on when you were growing up? You were ten years old and you were acting strong. My family moved around a lot. Mm -hmm. My my dad works uh, with missionaries, and uh, one of my friends um, in Mexico, uh, I became good friends with his family. Uh, so I guess that when I was young, they would, even though I didn't directly speak of what was bugging me at the time mm -hmm. or anything or, or talk to them the way I talked to you right. uh, they were there for me yeah. uh, just in having a place to go and, and feel safe gee that was very fortunate very fortunate they were they, I guess they were a little different from your parents just in the way they were yeah yeah well, they were very warm. Uh, they were warm. My dad is not warm. Mm -hmm. My mother is, but I sort of feel like it's not. Uh, it's sort of a practiced warm. You mean she doesn't mean it? Or? She means it, but it's something that she was raised doing. Uh huh. To be warm. Women are warm. It's part mm -hmm. of her job. The family next door gave Tom what he needed. By making that point to Tom, Dr. Cooper helps him to see that his dissatisfaction with people in his present life is partly due to this unconscious childhood disappointment with his own family. All of this comes out only bit by bit. Eventually, the unconscious issue of wanting, let's say, to be uh, cared for the way a 10-year-old boy needs to be cared for would it would emerge in the therapy uh, with me or it might emerge uh, also in his uh, uh, relationship with someone else in his life uh, so it, it emerges gradually and I don't think that the analyst therapist always knows in advance exactly what the conflict is uh, and that's why it takes time because uh, it's not uh, something that you can uh, verbalize uh, simply it has a lot to do with his his internal feelings. The psychodynamic therapist helps the patient bring to the surface and understand the meaning of unexpressed thoughts and feelings through various means. The chief one of which is free association, encouraging the patient to say anything that comes to mind, no matter how bizarre or apparently irrelevant it may seem to be. The therapist also listens for and helps interpret slips of the tongue, dreams, and fantasies. Also crucial to psychodynamic therapy is the transference, in which the patient plays out or transfers on to the therapist emotions and conflicts left over from important relationships, such as the mother, father, or siblings. By pointing out the transference to the patient, the therapist helps make the conflict conscious. Dr. Cooper explains how Tom's conflict with his father may emerge in this transference. Uh, I think he's going to, at some point, transfer onto me a lot of the feelings and attitudes that his father presented him with and uh, we're going to have to deal with that uh, transferential material uh, so that he can see that uh, he's automatically um, reliving or imitating or doing what he was asked to do 
uh, and uh, that he's not really relating to me. Part of what he's going to do is he's going to react as if I were people from his past, and that's the transference. Another central concept of psychodynamic theory is that people develop defenses to keep painful ideas out of awareness. And theorists have named a whole series of these mechanisms, including projection, repression, rationalization, denial, overcompensation, and displacement. People are limited in their ability to do things um, for various reasons, and somebody who's psychodynamic might say it's their defenses that are preventing them from doing something or saying something or realizing something, because if they did, they become too anxious. And I think that the, w the way, and therefore what one needs to do is, from a psychodynamic point of view, is to get them to loosen their defenses and feel less afraid to take the risk to open up and recognize what they're afraid of doing or do what they're afraid of doing. The fact that feelings and thoughts can be too difficult to deal with to enter our conscious mind means that the psychodynamic therapist will spend a great deal of time helping the patient uncover these buried thoughts and emotions. I don't know. I'm, I'm really caught up in a, in a problem here of, of my sense of, of duty to my job and doing it well. In Tom's case, it appears that as a child, he developed a strict sense of duty to avoid dealing with more intense and dangerous emotions. When did you find out that, that Andy died through suicide? I found that out when my father told me. He that. told you that at the time? Yeah. And did you ask him, like, why? Uh, no. I was, um... I remember being really scared at the time. Uh, and I didn't want to ask anybody anything. Um... So you dealt with it just by tightening up and keeping it in? Yeah. And, and your father, I guess, would have approved of that, and did approve of it. Yeah. And your mother also? She was probably the most outwardly emotional mm -hmm. in my family about the incident. You mean in terms of her grief? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we all pretty much were just trying to be strong for her. So how did other people in the family, including you, grieve the loss of Amy? I don't think we did. Um, not really, now that I'm uh, an adult and can look at it. Mm -hmm. um, we just put on a, a front. And inside, though, you kept your feelings tight. The cognitive behavioral model, rather than focusing on past experiences of childhood or unconscious conflicts, tries to understand factors in the present that are influencing and maintaining thinking and behavior. This model draws both on cognitive theory, which believes that faulty thinking causes maladaptive behavior and emotional problems, and on behavior theory, which emphasizes the importance of altering current behavior rather than focusing on the past. For Dr. Lorette Morris, the past mainly offers clues to the source of faulty learning patterns, with the focus on encouraging new ways to behave. You can't discount the learning experiences that occur earlier on in life. Uh, to the degree that they seem to be part of an overall pattern that still is being maintained, then they are, are of interest to me. It does not necessarily mean that I have to go back to that time in his life to ch create a behavior change now. You see, it's just, it, to me, it's information that tells me how he developed the patterns that he has now. And when we talk about behavior change, I like to focus on what currently, current situations he's dealing with. In this cognitive behavioral session, the actor playing Tom presents therapist Lorette Morris with the same problems he told to Dr. Cooper in the psychodynamic sessions. Dr. Morris also focuses on Tom's lack of expressiveness 
that Dr. Cooper identified earlier, but concentrates so primarily on his problems at work. What would you like to be able to say to your boss if you, if you had the, another opportunity to try and communicate the way you've been feeling? What would you like to, to tell him? That he shouldn't be in his position. That he's not helping anybody mm -hmm. in being in this position and uh, I just I, I don't think that he's a good manager mm -hmm. okay um, now how realistic do you think it is to tell someone that I couldn't right okay and how do you think you would react if you told him that the role of the cognitive behavioral therapist is to help the patient develop new thought patterns which lead to more productive behavior and to practice more appropriate behaviors in this safe therapeutic setting. Okay, is there something else you could communicate to him that would, you think would make working with him easier? I mean, he's obviously in that position. Well, I keep hoping that he'll realize that if he just leaves me alone he can go off and do whatever he wants to and, and uh, things will get taken care of and he can just lay off mm -hmm. um, he feels that he's doing his job when he's giving me a hard time mm -hmm. he thinks that that's part of his job is to stand over my shoulder and watch me work mm -hmm. and, and find what he thinks are mistakes in my work so it sounds like it would be useful for you to learn how to cope with his style in a way such that you don't end up with headaches and yeah. you know pain in your neck and other reactions that you're having because you can't control him. Mm -hmm. Changing faulty or non-productive thinking is the goal in a technique called cognitive restructuring, which we see in this session. In this case, the topic is Tom's difficulty in expressing himself with his supervisor at work and his eagerness to assign blame. Um, I heard him come in and I heard him joking with the secretary and my first thought was, this is, a, is going to be a wasted day. All this work that I'm doing right now is, is futile. Uh, and I suddenly got very, very angry. Um, and was sort of um, um, angry at myself for putting the time and effort in to correct the problem. Mm -hmm. Now, what exactly did you t say to yourself? You said you got angry at yourself. Well, my first thought was, okay, Dave's here. He's going to come in. Um, and we're going to have to take care of something else and this project is going to get laid aside and he's going to say that that wasn't an important thing to do anyway and it's never going to get done until there's a crisis um, the second thing that I was that I said to myself was well what a fool you are for even thinking that uh, you can be effective while he's around mm -hmm. um, why why are you bothering um, so what we're talking about is that you two often disagree on how the job should be done and it sounds like you start to do the job the way you think it should be done but when you realize that he might want it differently <coughs> then you put yourself down <clears throat> for having your own ideas about how to do the job you, you referred you said what a fool I am to do this now do you really believe that you were a fool in that situation? I don't. I of course I think what I'm doing is important. Okay. And it's not. So what else? Really a waste of time. What else could you have told yourself then, instead of saying, "What a fool I am"? As you have described it, you might be interrupted from what you were doing, or you might not be able to finish it. But instead of calling yourself a fool because you even attempted to do it, what else could you have told yourself? Well, I could just be angry at him. 
I, I just feel really powerless. When he's around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what sort of thoughts is that? Do you tell yourself that support that belief that you're powerless? Well, I'm, I'm uh, in a very real sense powerless mm -hmm. because, uh, because of our relative positions mm -hmm. in the company. Okay. Um, How do you think you could reframe your view of the situation then such that you don't end up blaming yourself? Because he's the boss. I mean, this is I don't know if it's possible. I'm, I'm actually thinking that I might have to change jobs soon. Do you think that would be the solution to your problem? I think so because I, I, um, I've gotten, I, I got along just fine in this job before he was there, just fine. Uh, I really enjoyed my work. I, I love. I loved it. I really liked the company. I liked the people there, and now it's all turned around, and it's and it's it's him. Mm -hmm. It's not me. Cognitive restructuring is only the beginning. Once the patient has learned to recognize and then reevaluate faulty thinking, and thereby reduce emotions that interfere with productive action, the therapist and patient role play or rehearse these new actions. For instance, Dr. Morris might role play Dave with Tom playing himself several times until Tom feels comfortable in this hypothetical situation. Some of the work Dr. Morris is doing with Tom begins to pay off. Here, in a later session, she talks with him about the gains he's made from the cognitive restructuring technique. But I've seen great improvement in terms of your ability to, to cope with Dave and to not let Dave generate all these negative reactions about yourself. Yeah. I, I still I still feel very negatively toward him. Towards him. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, I think that my my starting to think about moving on is not not so much uh, what it might have been a month ago mm -hmm. when I felt really out of control of the situation. Mm -hmm. um, it's more like I'm realizing that, yeah, my ideas are good and they're, and I'm a good manager, uh, and this company is not allowing me to be a good manager. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing now is, is um, realizing that I'm, I'm worth more than this and I could probably be happier someplace else that mm -hmm. would appreciate what I had to offer. Mm -hmm. Which is a very different, uh, phenomenon altogether. It's, I think it's healthier for you. Gestalt therapy focuses on becoming aware of and expressing emotions in the here and now. We look at people as having uh, a tremendous range of resources, intelligence, emotions, uh, energies, creativity, uh, desires, needs, wants, uh, abilities, and uh, we also tend to see that people have limitations in what aspects of themselves they have access to and also in what aspects of the environment they feel they have access to. Often these limitations or inhibitions require an active intervention on the part of the therapist. In Gestalt therapy, the therapist uses such techniques as exploration of dreams, creative visualization, and body-centered awareness. Let's just start with uh, what you're aware of right now. Okay. Right now I'm aware of the fact that my thighs feel kind of tight mm -hmm. and I can feel the, feel the air pushing against my belly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there seems to be a whole area of tightness right in through here. Gestalt therapy very much is attuned to what is going on physically with the patient and tries to help them to become aware of what is going on in their body and how they're experiencing it. And uh, al although it had its roots in psychodynamic therapy, Gestalt therapy moved on uh, and um, began to work with the idea that a person's emotional experiences have an impact on their body. And it's kind of like a um, the remnants of the past somehow can be detected by seeing what is going on 
somebody physically, as well as their current emotionality. In this actual first therapy session, yeah. Alan Cohen helps Deborah become aware of and begin to undo her self inhibitions. Now, what are you aware of in your legs right now? Um, you, where... It's kind of like they're clutching. Mm -hmm. it's, they're holding their ground. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you were to let your legs speak, uh, rather than they, I, mm -hmm. speak as your legs. I'm not too sure about this. Wait a minute, not one more inch. Let's see where we're going here. Mm -hmm. I'm not real sure about this. Uh-huh. Okay, great. A tool called the empty chair technique helps clients find within themselves the influence of key people who have contributed to their personality and experience. So, for example, uh, if someone is telling me about their mother uh, and complaining to me about their mother, I might be more interested in having them visualize this mother in the chair sitting opposite them and complain to the mother and heighten the experience of complaining. Now see if you can pay attention to what feeling goes along with that. The fear comes up again. Fear? Mm-hmm. Okay. Huh? You're going to squash me. Okay. Now it's who? the feeling that comes along with that. Okay. Who's the you? Who's going to squash you? Mom, you're going to squash me. Okay. So now we have a dialogue with mom. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, put mom in that chair. Okay. You stay right where you are. Mm -hmm. Put mom in that chair. And before you speak to her, let yourself see her. All right. Visualize her. Okay. Describe what you see. In Gestalt therapy, we um, start with the present situation. The, and the present situation consists of what the person uh, presents as the patient and how they present themselves. So we're interested in uh, the presenting uh, problem, for example, uh, I, uh, I'm feeling depressed or I'm thinking about changing my job or my marriage isn't working out or I'm lonely or whatever. <clears throat> but we're also interested in how the person presents themselves. Uh, someone who presents uh, him or herself as lonely and in the process of doing that as avoiding eye contact uh, is showing us not only that they're lonely but how they keep themselves lonely by avoiding contact. Oh, mommy, this hurts. You're squashing me. I don't like this. It hurts. Does she hear you? No. No, she doesn't hear you. No. Okay. Now, come over here. Okay. Now, could you be a mother who doesn't hear her daughter? Mm-hmm. Okay. And speak mm -hmm. as that mother. What's your, what's your experience as this mother? Honey, I'll be with you in a little while. I've got the turkey in the oven, and I'm juggling five or six different things right now. I just, just be quiet for a little while, and I get back to you. I have to get this done. I have company coming, and it needs to get done on time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what's your reaction to this, to this little girl over here who's kind of asking for your attention when you're trying to do things? Irritation and guilt. Uh -huh. okay. We are looking to create some new situations. We are looking to provide for the person the possibility to become aware of how they maintain an old status quo and also to provide the opportunity to try out new experiences and behaviors and therefore to try out new ways of experiencing themselves and the world. So far, this program has concentrated on the differences between forms of psychotherapy. The psychodynamic, emphasizing insight. So you dealt with it just by tightening up and keeping it in? Yeah. And your father, I guess, would have approved of that, and did approve of it. The cognitive behavioral, 
emphasizing changes in thinking and behavior. That are important to you. What else could you have told yourself then instead of saying, what a fool I am? What else could you have told yourself? Well, I could just be angry at him. And what thought would that have Which I you usually am anyway. Mm -hmm. The gestalt, emphasizing experiencing the body and its way of expressing emotions. And what are you aware of in your legs right now? Are you, are you... It's kind of like they're clutching. Mm -hmm. They're holding their ground. Now, if you were to let your legs speak, uh, rather than they, I, mm -hmm. speak as your legs. Mm -hmm. In practice, however, most present-day psychotherapists integrate their methods of doing therapy, often borrowing from orientations other than their own, in order to meet the particular needs of their patients. So a behavior therapist who is focusing on action but sees that the patient really needs to experience more emotionally can use methods of Gestalt therapy. The psychodynamic therapist might choose to use cognitive or behavioral techniques to encourage patients to act in new ways. In its highest form, I would think of it as more of, as an integrative approach to different forms of therapy, to be able to select from other forms of therapy something that may seem to be dictated by the case at hand. Often an individual's relationship with someone else becomes central to the therapy. So sometimes it makes sense to actually bring family members or significant others into the therapy session. Here two actors using case histories of real people play Wanda and Harry Jakes. Wanda has already had a few sessions with the therapist. Now for the first time they are meeting with the therapist together as a couple. Well, I'm really glad that uh, you wanted to join us. Good. What's going on? I don't know. I don't know. You don't have to look at me like that. Like what? This is what I don't know. You don't have to look at me like that. Like what? <sighs> How did I look at you? If the real reason Harry agreed to be here is because the other night, well, it's, it's really, we don't have to go into it. It's, it's so minute. It's, no, it's foolish. It really is foolish. Tell me what She's happened. Curious. She's well, curious. Tell me what happened. It's unbelievable because I didn't make, didn't make the, this time it was the pork chops, the way your mother wanted the pork chops made. And I told you the reason why, which I usually don't. And so then you must be doing something to me so he should be here. What? What happened the other night with the pork chops? Very, very frequently, um, couples will come in for treatment complaining they don't communicate to each other. And what they will then bring up are what seems to be very, very trivial issues. The therapist in couples work uh, operates under the assumption that the disagreement about this surface issue is really um, a reflection of an underlying theme or an underlying agenda that's hidden. So that there's a need to get to this hidden agenda and recognize that the trivial argument is really about something totally different. And typically, the uh, hidden agendas involve two major issues in, in the vast majority of cases where there's couple problems. Um, the issues of control and the issues of love. The issue of control is who's in charge? Who's the active one? Who's the passive one? Who's telling who what to do? Who's stepping on somebody else's freedom? The issue of love is really the issue of the absence of love. It's um, you don't care about me. You don't pay enough attention to me. You're not concerned about my welfare. So the pork chops may very well be, you don't care about me. Here's something that I like, and you don't care to do something for me. Okay. Which means you don't love me. How long have we been married? How long have you known how this is supposed to be made? It was a little thing, not a big thing, not a it's big deal. It's the same thing. It's the same thing over and over and over again. And Side which I mean, who I mean, really, in terms of how important is it with the pork chops? I mean, what it really comes down to is 
It's just, just everything. It doesn't make any difference what it is. If it's not the pork chops, and it's it's something else. I think that essentially family what therapy um, is a situation in which you are dealing with different individuals as they combine in a system. A family does go through stages of development, and you have to understand what stage of development this family is at. You have to understand how they are either enmeshed or are they in terms of being intertwined too much and they are not allowing the members of the family to be their own person. I just like things to be nice and smooth. I'm under a tremendous amount of pressure at work and I don't need to be made to feel that I'm under the same kind of pressure at home. And I, home should be a place that is a good place to come to. Emotion free? Um, unstressful. Okay. Sometimes emotions can be stressful. All right. Okay. So your wife has all these feelings inside of her and she has all these emotions and you find it difficult to deal with them and you feel sort of inadequate when she goes on crying? That was No, I, I don't feel inadequate. Okay. I don't ever really feel inadequate about anything. Uh, what I feel, as I said, is confused. Um, the least little thing can set her off and I frankly don't know what it is. Even today, as soon as I open my mouth, the big sighing and the tears started and we're off and running again and this is what happens at home. Wendt and Harry are not a very uncommon couple. Wendt and Harry is the combination of an individual, you know, the uh, sort of obsessive compulsive type of personality that everything has to be so and with an awful lot of structures and who actually is very attracted to feelings but very scared of them at the same time. And then on the other hand, Wanda has more of the hysterical features of the hysterical personality and she's all emotion and feeling. And what was happening was that probably what attracted the two of them to each other is what now is pushing them apart. As Dr. Rivas Vasquez points out, she sees many couples like this, where both people are trying to get what she calls their neurotic needs met. So as one individual goes to therapy, individual therapy now, and they work through their neurotic needs, uh, they lose the need that they have for the other person and the relationship might break because relationships are a balance. Granted that many times there are a neurotic balance, but nevertheless a balance. So one of the complicating factors in doing couples work is that the focus is not solely on the communication or the relationship but uh, there are personal issues that each one has. And while the therapy is not trying to deal terribly much with those personal issues, uh, it must recognize them. It must recognize that the limitations of how any individual reacts with a spouse is a function of their own personal limitations, which might be the subject matter of individual therapy that's exactly what Dr. Rivas Vasquez suggested for Harry. To get at his feelings about the difficulties in the marriage, she sees him in a solo session. And if perhaps I could understand you a little bit better so I can help her, and the two of you could essentially understand what each other is all about and what needs. She, when people are unhappy, we're talking about people not having emotional needs being met. It, it's it's an intangible thing. It's a lot of times people don't know what will make them happy. Yeah. You know, she wasn't too clear about exactly what would make her happy. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's something she's going to have to figure out. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the three of us at a given later date might be able to do that. Uh, maybe. Okay. What makes you happy? order. When everything about me is in order, then I can think clearly. Mm -hmm. 
it's like before I'm about to do an operation, having everything laid out exactly the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And having everybody in place and having things done because it's such a precise function. That, and that should be carried over into everything. Mm -hmm. um, when my house, when everything I own, when the people in my life are in order, then I can keep thinking clearly. It must be quite distressing to you then when you see this amount of emotion that are really lacking order. Sort of uncomfortable. Well, I suppose emotions can be in order also. Is that what Although you're Harry Jakes is beginning to open up, the gap between the Jakeses is apparently very great. In addition to recommending that they continue couples therapy, Dr. Rivas Vasquez will probably suggest that each of them continue in individual therapy as well. If I could trust people enough, or trust you guys enough, to talk through things while I'm working them out, it would probably make life a lot easier. In the group setting, each person comes with his or her own kind of problem. But group therapy offers the opportunity to discuss and work through common issues as well. It also offers a safe atmosphere to take risks in expressing feelings, to try out new behaviors, and to give and to receive honest feedback. In individual therapy, the relationship between patient and therapist becomes very important. In group therapy, it's the cohesion of the group that is parallel to that therapeutic relationship. So that the group in that sense becomes um, really an ideal living laboratory for people who are having problems in dealing with others, regardless of what these problems may be. Dolores McCarthy, a social worker, leads this group session involving her actual clients, some of whom she also sees individually. One of the things about a group is you have a chance to see how a client will act with other people instead of just report situations. So it's a real life experience for a client. Another thing is that they'll get a, a real sense of sharing, not being alone. They won't feel so different. Um, they get a real sense of hope from hearing other people go through situations. Um, particularly people that are dealing with issues with other people, relationships and so on, they get a chance to practice, maybe getting courage up to talk about something that's frightening or to somebody who's shy to be a chance to be more open and also to get feedback from peers and those things really work best in a group setting. Because, I mean I do have that independent streak and I really want I want to be able to do it myself and not not risk you know having to give up something to to get help. Um, what but would I, you risk here? What is it that you would I don't I'm about? not sure I mean I I don't know exactly um, but there is some kind of there's some fear of, of losing control or or I, I'm, I'm trying to, I guess one of the, the big fears is that I'll become too dependent, that I, that I have such a need to be dependent on people that if I start, um, yeah, I mean, I can, I'm giving you a, a concrete example. Um, I've talked about Jen in the past, and, and um, we're sort of involved again. But I feel like I'm, I'm afraid now that, because she's my one outlet in terms of, being open, and I mean, I can cry in front of her at any at, at the drop of a hat. I can, I can talk to her about anything. I can, you know, I can really tell her what I'm feeling at any moment. I feel like I'm sort of putting all my eggs in that one basket, and that it's going to be too much for her to handle. And that, and so I'm like sort of pulling my pulling myself back and saying, stop, you know, don't don't pick up the phone and call her because she can't, she doesn't need to your burdens on her too. Um, group therapy can be a various therapeutic orientation. In leading this group, Dolores McCarthy uses a combination of approaches. My training is what would be called psychodynamic or psychoanalytic in, in the way that I think through situations. But I have been influenced a lot by interpersonal approaches to psychology. In other words, how people act in the here and now with each other at a particular place. You can trace that back to a, um, an origin in somebody's childhood, but I think that's only if something gets stuck that that should be done. It's not, to me, the purpose of therapy. The purpose is to have new experiences with real people in life. I was thinking over the weekend, I wanted to ask you all a question, because last week 
I remember towards the end, I felt like I, I was saying to everybody, I felt like two different people most of the time, like this emotional person, this logical person. And I was wondering how I acted. If any of you would tell me, do I act like two different, like two different people? people, or do I ever? Or because I'm always curious, as if it's something that I just keep inside, and I I worry and wonder about it myself, or if it's something I do on the outside. And sometimes I use like people's reactions as mirrors to how I feel about myself, and then then I get like. I wonder. Do you think that you've actually shown those two people here in the group? Well, I, I think I have. See, I'm not sure sometimes if I oversimplify it and make it two separate people or if it's just something I've created in my head and it's more of a free-flowing thing, but I, like, make it... I don't know. I don't know if you've been two separate people, more than, like, two different layers. Hmm. Because I think there's a side of you that's very... Um, it's a very good listener and you're very empathetic and I think uh, you're very helpful and logical and rational you know when anybody's talking about something that's going on and then you know I'll be honest with you it surprises me like we talked about your apartment and we talked about you know um, your work situation your partner and your old boyfriend and I really thought my god you're going through so much and it took me by surprise that all this was happening because for a long time, you know, you would just, you talk about your family because we talk a lot about our families here. And you were so, you know, helpful and empathetic. And then I kind of feel like I was surprised that you had all of these other kind of mini crises going on because that's really what they, they are. And they seem to be, I mean, they only seem to come out, I think, when they seem a little overwhelming to you. Right. Well, that's what my life has, seemed, has yeah. been like in the last couple of years. It's just slowly gotten to a point where it seemed like it was manageable, then it became unmanageable, then I became frantic, and I became crazed. And that's when I thought, like, I wonder how I'm acting, because I wonder if I'm just keeping all this craziness inside or if it's really, like, coming out. And that's probably why you want to find out tonight. Like yeah, that's why I wanted to find out, because I've been thinking about it since the last, the last group. So all of a sudden, I thought, because when I said that, then it became it became very real to me that I did see myself as two people. And I remember you made a comment and you said, well, which one of you comes here? And then I started wondering, well, which, you know, does one of me come here? Or does both of me come here? Or Do you think I'm Jean's curious. description makes sense? Like she's it one does side make sense, and the yeah. other side is kind of in crisis. Is it the yeah. And yeah. You know, yeah. I felt like there was one side that really wanted to come out that it's yeah, hard it for you to let out. Yeah, yeah. it does most, most of the time. That's the side I've just, I've never let out. I don't, I don't really know, like, how to do it. Right. Yeah, because, I mean, yeah. the impression I get is you come here and you're, you're always very rational and very level and, you know, everything's on an even keel. And though you talk about the problems you're suffering, it's like you've already gone, you've already, like, put them at a distance and you're just telling us, telling us about them rather right. than, we're not experiencing yeah. them with you necessarily. Right. I mean, sometimes I think I do the same thing. Yeah, most, most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes. And that it's... What you bring here is a very calm, rational person, and and I mean, I get the impression from what you're telling us that that's not always that's not how you are all the time, no. and so you're not you're not letting us in on the other side completely. I mean, I can certainly identify with that, but I think all of us have read a lot more of, of what's re what's really there than maybe you've ex not expressed but shown, right? But it makes me realize how how controlled. You really are, and, I'm afraid of that and because there are a lot of things going on, like I said, uh, I remember one time when you were describing your life, it reminded me of like a swamp, you know, yeah. just lots of roots kind of intertwining and twisting around, and, and the fact that you do handle all of this, I have, I think, maybe more confidence in, in your ability to control them all than you do. One of the things that you get, especially in a group, is you get a transference to the group, not, a, not exactly in the specific sense of somebody is like their father, like their mother, like their brother, but a kind of transference to the world, in other, way. in other words, the way they see the group is often how they see the world. So someone who may feel um, on the kind of shy side, on the fearful side, will be fearful about being that way in the group. Paul was saying, I really want to be able to share more, because in the past few weeks we've been talking about why he doesn't how he tends to keep things to himself and how that limits him in his outside life as well as, as, well as in the group. I mean, I feel like I've, I've accomplished something here and, and over the past year, but I'm really, 
I'm real tentative about it. I'm like, you know, it's... You afraid the ideas the group gives you won't stick with you? That, yeah. That even when you're yeah, alone, that, you push everything That it's away. so new. You know, this mm -hmm. is... Sometimes, never... after a great deal of talk, there are moments when the group falls silent. And the therapist chooses not to intervene. There's different meanings of silence, and one of my jobs is to read what the silence is. So often, when there is a silence in a group, what it is is people processing information in a group. They really need time to let it sink in, and sometimes talking can be more a way to push something away. So one of the things is to get a kind of tone of the silence. Is it a silence of people thinking, or is it a silence of kind of resistance where people are afraid? If, you, if I would sense that the silence was more a fear to go forward than I would in interrupt and comment about the silence. But if the silence for people are integrating information, I think they need that to kind of make what's happening in the group be personal to them. I was thinking when you were talking about your parents and saying, you know, about the issue of them understanding what you do and all that, I was also thinking about myself mm -hmm. and my parents and, and, you know, whether they understand what I do and all and what I'm trying to do. and. Um, I'm, I'm at a point right now where I don't know if that, whether they'll understand completely. And there's one side of me that's trying to deal with that fact. And then there's another side of me that's saying that, uh, you know, I may be going by them so quickly that I may not at some, I may not be that dependent on them any longer for them to understand me. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how, if you are that much over it now, if you really don't care that much as to whether your parents understand what you're doing or not. You know? I still care. I still care a lot. And that, that's, the, that's the part that, that's the most, that I'm really working on now with Dolores is the, uh, is separating from my mother, you know. Like I've done it physically and now I, I feel like I need to find a way to put it in a good perspective emotionally. Because it's like, you know, I just can't, I can't seem to like, navigate around it. Psychotherapy is barely a hundred years old. Psychologists and researchers are continually searching for the best therapy for each patient or client. This effort to match therapist and orientation and setting with individual needs will doubtless continue. Funding for this program was provided by the Annenberg CPB Project. You can order these programs on video cassette. Call 1 800 Learner and visit us at www.learner.org/channel. The Annenberg CPB Channel.